Hi, I'm David Spencer and welcome back to Gardening with Bugs. Okay, let's talk about wireworm control. What are wireworms, you ask? Just kidding, of course you know what wireworms are. They're those little peach color, kind of cream colored um, larva. They're quite big. We call them wireworms because when you squeeze them, bend them in half, they snap. That's how you know it's a wireworm. Um, if that makes you squeamish, I'm sorry. And you don't have to do that. You can just tell that they're quite tough. Now they're not worms. Uh, wireworms are the larva of the click beetle. So these are grubs basically, um, beetle larva. Um, the problem is they're hard to control because they have a four year life cycle. So for four years, they are larva in the ground feeding on tubers and roots of plants before emerging as an adult, laying eggs and starting the cycle over again. So it's important to know the life cycle because that's going to give you a clue as to how difficult it is to control it and where our opportunities are to control it. So um, instead of just going through the life cycle and then the controls, let's just talk about the controls so that this video is nice and succinct um, and you get what you need out of it. So the first thing you can do right now, doesn't really matter what time of the year you are watching this, is think about preparing your bed by tilling the garden. Now, I know some of you think um, you want to do a no-till garden. Some of you think tilling is the, the devil's work for some reason. Um, remember, even like if you get in a textbook for no-till gardening, it typically starts with a very heavy till the first year and usually the second year because one of the main variables in your yields is compact soil. So even in its natural state, um, with that idea that all the roots and natural stuff creates all that, uh, great opportunity for your plants to grow. You will have absolutely an increased yield tilling it the first year. So don't be afraid to till. Um, if you are a no-till gardener, which I am too, I, I really don't like mechanically tilling um, for a whole variety of reasons, which we'll save for another video. Um, you still need to consider doing it first. And the, the, this is the most important reason why is you're killing a whole bunch of invertebrates, good and bad. But the studies have been done. Or Oregon State University did um, a big experiment with tilling. They were looking at uh, whether it increases the CO2 emissions, um, whether it warms the soil and what happens to the invertebrates. Massive study, really excellently done. And they found that if you are going to till heavy, you're going to kill the good and the bad bugs, but you hadn't increased yield. So it's really important. If you're measuring it in yield, that means that yes, you killed the good and the bad, but this was better than not tilling in the first place. So the way I see it from a bioprotection point of view, is from like an organic using biocontrols, um, you're gonna till it and that's gonna reset the clock for you, but you still need to then apply beneficial insects. So step number one, till the garden. If you're not gonna mechanically till it, which will actually physically kill them, um, then at least shovel it up, pitchfork it, do something to loosen up the soil for your plant's roots, but also to expose the wireworms. And that's the other part of it. You're not just killing them, when you're tilling, you're also bringing them exposed up to the surface. Now that's important because birds and ground beetles, a whole bunch of predators will find them. And if they find them, then they'll think that there's more and they'll start to search for you. And by loosening up the soil, you've then created better pathways for additional predators to go after those ones that have remained um, alive and protected in the soil. So a whole bunch of spiders, again, ground beetles, all, rove beetles, stuff like that, all these predators can get into the loosened soil much easier and continue the predation. So till your garden. Now add beneficial insects. Stradiolalap schematis, proven to eat the first instar larva in an effective way. Now the first instar means the adults in the summer have laid their eggs. Now the eggs like most eggs in um, the insect world tend to be protected, um, except for parasitoids, which specifically go after eggs and some specific uh, predators. Eggs sometimes, and for some reason, are just sort of left alone to their devices. It's when they hatch, as soon as there's movement, they actually smell like the prey, then we get predation. So stratiolalaps in the soil after you've tilled it will help reduce that population for subsequent years. Now keep this in mind, you're going to put it in there anyways because I talk about it all the time because it's going to eat fungus gnats, any overwintering spider mite that didn't have an opportunity to, to hide somewhere else will, ha will kind of have to go to ground to survive. A whole bunch of thrips that pupate in the ground like onion thrips and western flower thrips, for example. Um, you're going to control, help control them by eating them as they pupate in the soil with stratiolalap schematis. 
So put that in and it's going to help with the wireworms as well. But here's the big caveat. Because it's a four-year life cycle for the larva in the ground, we're only getting control with stratiolalaps in that first year. So that means to get real control with stratiolalaps, that's a four-year wait. Now that's painful, and I don't even really consider that biocontrol when you're farming and you're trying to reduce the numbers. And yes, you have to get it in because just like a fruit tree, when's the best time to plant a fruit tree? 20 years ago. Well, the best time to have applied stratiolalaps to the soil, again, for 20 years ago. Um, you don't really have to reapply it as long as you're not heavily tilling. So get that in the ground. So we've tilled it, we've added our, our beneficial mites, beneficial insects, but they're not, they're uh, predatory mites in the soil. So stratiolalaps is now in the ground. That's going to help us. Now you can put your crop in, but there will be some pressure, not just from wireworms, but from a whole bunch of pests. So there's one little trick you can do. This isn't for everybody because it could be very expensive and a lot of work, but you could put a trap plant in there. So say I'm going to plant a whole row of carrots. Maybe what I want to do is pop a couple potatoes in. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go out and buy potatoes. I mean, that's kind of defeating the purpose. Um, but those ones that get left in the cupboard and they're starting to sprout, sure, I might dice that up into a couple cubes, pop them in the soil, leave them for a couple days, and then pull them out when the wireworms and some other pests of tubers have gone towards them. Now I can carefully take them out, murder them, um, and then my bed is in a better situation than it was before. Now, again, if you're a big time farmer, like it's not cost effective to plant a whole bunch of sacrificial crops of anything. So I don't necessarily recommend that, but it is one of the tools that I wanted to highlight for you. Now, another one is at the end of the season. So you've had wireworm uh, problems. You've tilled it already. The stratolaps are in the soil. Uh, you're going to leave it uh, for the winter time. Plant mustards. Um, now, be careful because in some areas, uh, mustards can be invasive. Um, there's a couple types that are. I typically plant just the, it's called white mustard here, but that's the one that you, you'd make prepared yellow mustard with. Um, so there are a whole bunch of varieties, so check which ones are available to you. But the important thing about mustard is when rain hits the leaves, the water that falls off can have compounds in it that um, are noxious to a lot of pests. Um, we know it's true of like some nematodes and stuff like that, with some pest nematodes. So it's great because you're not necessarily killing anything, but they will want to leave that area. Now, Wireworms don't crawl very fast or very far. So yes, they'll leave the area, but they'll come back in when you when you plant your new crop. So just keep that in mind that in a big area, the mustard crops will actually help kind of reset the clock when you go back to planting again. So do consider that one. Now, there are other opportunities to treat the soil. Um, so you can use uh, MET42, which is finally produced again by uh, Lalleman, a, a Quebec company. Um, super effective. It kills a whole bunch of invertebrates in the soil, so you mix it in, it's bacteria that, that kills the plants. Um, it's expensive though, so again, that's, that might not be um, applicable to a lot of you. In fact, even big growers, it, it's quite, uh, quite cost prohibitive. But that is an option, and Ag Canada did do quite a few studies showing that it did help reduce the wireworm trouble to begin with. So if you're watching this video, chances are your farming in a place that used to be or growing your garden is in a place that used to be turf. Now the reason why is because the reason why I'm guessing that you were growing in turf, um, some grasses, what used to be lawn, is because wireworms love those. Cliff beetles love to put their eggs in there. Grass isn't great because it has a whole bunch of uh, um, organic material, like it breaks down quite quick. So that duff layer, the soil and all the dead plant material is quite thick with, with grasses. Um, plus they're protected. So in that dense foliage, they're protected from birds and stuff like that. So wireworms are a real problem in places where you've pulled up grass. So just like I'm doing on the farm, using the sod cutter, I'm removing grass, which has been grass for a long time. So the wireworms are just horrific in this spot. So keep that in mind too, is you're starting off in the worst case scenario when you're removing grass in order to plant some fruits and fruits and vegetables. So even though I'm removing grass just in my garden beds alone, it means that the wireworms are untouched in the grass right next to me. So this is where I would have to be very careful. Yes, the strategy, the tilling is going to happen. The strategy laps are going in. I'm not going to use the MET 42 um, just for cost reasons, um, unless I want to set up a trial maybe. Um, so what I'm going to have to pay attention to is what I'm planting. Um, and when those cliff beetles are going to come in, or what can I do to kind of prevent their spread? So I'm actually going to dig deep ditches that's going to prevent the, just the lateral movement. 
um, and then I'm going to do cover crops as well. So we'll get to see together if you if you subscribe as we go through this garden, we'll, we'll continue to manage wireworms together in this set. Um, but all you need to know right now is if you're turning turf into a garden, you're in the worst case scenario for for the wireworms. So heavily till make sure that you have a, a very defined border that you're going to maybe treat with some trap plants I and mean, some growers actually will put potatoes around sacrificial row of potatoes around their main crop believe it or not as expensive as that is but the wireworms can be so bad um, so keep in mind that they're going to be coming in from the sides um, and then make sure to utilize these cover crops as well so wireworm control super tough and like i said it's a four-year system of kind of getting these out of, of areas um, I mentioned Stradiolilaps. People have tried Delosia coriaria, which is a rove beetle. Um, it can attack them at a slightly bigger stage, but there isn't really a peer-reviewed paper out there saying that these will control wireworms to the same extent that Stradiolilaps will. So um, some people use them, and I, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm also not going to encourage you as part of these controls because we know tilling is absolutely a control for wireworms, leaving them exposed. Uh, to the birds and other predation is a very effective way of biocontrol. Stradiolilaps is a very good way of stopping the continual reproduction of wireworms. Um, and then it's these trap plants um, or mustard crops that can just kind of help. So those are really the tools that we're going to be talking about right now. So that's wireworms. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and kind of understood um, enough about them to know how you're going to have to treat them in the yard. Um, and feel free to ask questions, just um, respond to the, to the video there and I, I hopefully can get back to you. Um, and subscribe because we'll continue this discussion, like I said, we'll go into other topics, but you're going to get to see throughout the farming process how we're going to be adjusting for and dealing with and assessing the amount of wireworms that we have. And it should be what you're doing as well. So good luck. Uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.